Oh man. Hey folks. Sheesh, my mind is like I wish some some week I could just show you what's going on in my mind. <laughs> Like, I was so flooded there. It's just crazy. Just so distracted and flooded and thoughts and things and seeing the people and people I love and, man, and just focus on something that we're doing here. <laughs> well, on Acts 15 is where we're going to be today. We got to get moving here. All right, Acts 15, so we're just going to dive right into this. I already told you the culture is going to be the culture of grace. We'll, we'll review a little bit. Um, so, on, so this is actually going to be the last of the culture parts of this series, and then uh, our brother Steve's going to bring us home next week at the, to finish up Acts as a whole, and then we'll shift gears into something different next month. So Acts chapter 15 today, we've been talking about church culture and what what what, what that looks like and different little kind of key words about culture, and, and uh, today Acts chapter 15, 1 to 21, and I think that's just part of what's hit me is kind of the buildup from first service. And then now just um, I wanted to end with this one because it's so powerful. This this is it. This is everything right here. And again, it's a word we throw around so often. But to just really capture the full significance of what we're saying when we say grace. This is everything. The message of God's grace, the good news, the gospel, salvation, everything we know and believe to be true. It's right here. And yet, it gets so confusing. So Acts chapter 15, and we see a bit of this confusion right here. Acts 15 verse 1, but some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with him, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believed who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. And all the assembly fell silent and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return, and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to to abstain from the things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from what has been strangled, from and from blood. For from ancient generations Moses has been has had in every city those who proclaimed him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. 
As we're talking about a culture of grace, we're talking about God's grace. So what is grace? I, again, I appreciate uh, the, the opening in Matt and talking about ch charity and, 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 and that we are charity cases. God's grace, God's gift to us, that I didn't deserve it. It's, it's a free gift to me. It's something that God gave and God handed over to us through his son, Jesus Christ. I didn't put this one in your notes. Um, I debated it. I took it out, but I can't talk about grace without going to Romans chapter 3, Romans 3, 21 to 26. It's such a powerful foundational passage. So let's just hold Acts 15. We'll come back to a couple of things there, but Romans 3, 21 to 26. If you have been here any length of time, you should have a little note by it. It's highlighted, a heart on it, a circle, put it, put a mark, something on that page. If I, if I could only have one page of scripture, this might be the one, one paragraph, one section. There is so much that's packed into Romans 3, 21 to 26. And when we think about God's grace and, and, and his unmerited favor, his blessings to us, his gift to us, that getting something that I did not ever deserve. Have you ever gotten something that you did not deserve? You've gotten something as a free gift and somebody that just gave something to you. Have you ever got something that you didn't deserve from somebody that you didn't deserve it from? Somebody that you hurt, somebody that you harmed, and yet they did something to, for you or for me just for no reason, just to help you and to be there for you and to give you this gift. But um, when Hannah went to, when Hannah was going to kindergarten, I don't know. I mean, I, I cry about everything. So when Hannah was going to kindergarten, for some reason, I'd already been through this, but it just, it wrecked me. I was just a wreck. And Sarah and I would go to breakfast, have the kids go on the first day of school. And so Hannah's going to kindergarten. I wouldn't look at Sarah. I, for some reason, I, I still try to pretend that I don't cry in front of Sarah. As if 26 years, she has not seen me cry like a thousand times. But still to this day, I don't want to do it in front of her. And I try so hard not to. So I wouldn't look at her. I wouldn't talk to her. I didn't want it, nothing. Everything good. Let's go to breakfast. Everything's good. You know, I'm going to do some push-ups, and then we're going to, let's go get some breakfast. So we go to Cracker Barrel, and and on the way there, I wanted to fill the void because I didn't want to talk because I was going to cry. So I turned on. I made a mistake. I turned on country radio. So here I'm listening to country radio, and this song that I don't know the name of I, uh, or the artist, it's uh, If Heaven Weren't So Far Away, and I'm singing, just thinking this song, and it's about, you know, death, and boy, if heaven weren't so far I would just go to heaven and see this loved one and I'm like if Rootstown Elementary weren't so far away the half a mile from my house I would just go there and see my little girl and they're taking her away from me and manipulating and brainwashing her and she's never going to be the same and, and so I'm thinking all these things and then we pull into the parking lot of Cracker Barrel and Sarah doesn't like country and she's like man that song's depressing and I went no it's not and I, I jammed the radio shut and I just the flood the heavens were open I just wept like a baby and and Sarah's like consoling me and you gonna be okay. You know, you want to go. She said, do you want to go home? I said, no, I'm fine. And she's crying too. I mean, she cries too. And so we go into Cracker Barrel and we're both just bawling our eyes out and sitting it there and we look a mess and a member of the church walks by. <laughs> and I'm like, oh great. Like, what are they thinking right now? Or I feel bad for them. Really pray for our, our pastor here. They're going through some rocky marriage problems. And then we go out and our bill had been paid for. And it just, just uh, what a blessing. I had moments like that happen like that's a long-winded story just to say all that but that's a slice of what's going on in my brain uh the beauty of god's grace when it just hits you from nowhere of gift that boy i didn't see that coming in romans 3 21 to 26 i love how it begins but but now the righteousness of god where how do i get right with god and and all the attempts to 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 honor the law and to keep the law and it says but now i'm gonna tell you a message now the righteousness how we get right with God. It's been made known. It's been manifested and it's apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through what? Through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace. Justified meaning just if I'd never sinned. I, it's, it's a slate has been wiped clean. By what? Not by my work, not by my effort, not by the things that I've done, but by his grace, by, by a gift, as a gift, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. He's redeemed me. He's, he's brought us back. He's brought us back and bought us back. Whom God put forward, his son, Jesus, as a propitiation by his blood. Propitiation, I know, Allison, you've got it. Propitiation means what? 
Snickers. <laughs> we, we're going to go with that. Romans 7 is the doo-doo passage in this church, and Romans 3, 21 to 26 is Snickers. Snickers mean because propitiation means the wrath of God against sin has been satisfied. So propitiation means satisfied. The wrath of God has been satisfied, I think, Snickers commercials. So it's Snickers, meaning it's taken care of. It's good. It's all taken care of. Why? By what? By through what? To be or to be received by faith. My faith in what Jesus Christ has done for me. His gift. His justification over me. His gift of grace, redemption, propitiation. And all of this was to show God's righteousness. Because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. Beautiful, powerful, just loaded imagery there. It was to show his righteousness at the present time. So that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. Remember in Exodus? The death did not come to that house if what? It would pass over. If there was blood on the doorposts or saved by the blood of the Lamb, passed over former sin. Just such wonderful, it's a loaded imagery. Back to Acts 15. This, this beautiful picture of grace and what grace is and all of these wonderful terms and, and ways of thinking about it. We just read this, but again, just highlighting it now as we're thinking about grace. Verse 7, after there had been much debate, Peter stood up. He said to them, brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what we just read in Romans 3, 21 to 26. All the good news, or the, the good things that Christ Christ has done for you and for me the, the, the good news of the gospel and believe in that. Verse 8, and God who knows the heart bore witness to them in giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. The Holy Spirit. Now we go to Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 1 13 and Ephesians chapter 2 and all the gifts and the blessings of the grace of Jesus Christ and Ephesians 1 13 says having believed we were signed and sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. Signed, sealed, delivered. I'm yours. I'm, I'm his. Uh, verse 9, and he made no distinction between us and them. That sounds just like what we just read in Romans 3, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are we putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples? Yoke meaning teaching. Why are we putting this teaching on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? This, this load of carrying the law and trying to practice these things and trying to do it. Why, why are we trying to put this on these new Gentile believers? Because verse 11, we believe that we will be saved through what? The grace of our Lord Jesus, just as we will. How are we saved? By the grace of God, by the grace and the goodness of God, by the charity and the love and the favor of God over our lives, by the things that God has done for us, not by my works, not by the things that you and I have done. It's not about how good I am. It's not about how good I think I am. It's not about how bad I am. It's not about how bad I think I am, but it's about how amazing his grace is. Grace is this free gift to you and I, but it came at a just tremendous cost of the life of God's Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's grace. It's a gift. It's amazing how quickly we can receive something like that and to say, man, I'm saved by God's grace. Did you hear this? Glory, hallelujah. Good news. I'm saved by God's grace. And then we walk out of here and somebody like cuts us off. Send them to hell. Right? What happens that causes us to hear and to receive such an amazing gift and message of God's goodness and grace over, over our lives? But then it's like disrupted or lost in translation and it doesn't carry over into our actions and our words sometimes or we put so many other things on top of it. And what I would call this is these grace blockers grace blockers or I want to just stop this or I suddenly have got this great message and I want to keep it and preserve it and maybe it starts off in a good way and the integrity of it and then I feel like I know all the rules there's a book I read many years ago uh, by a guy named Greg Boyd and he said that uh, there's a chapter I don't remember the name of the book but the cha there's a chapter I always loved that's always just stuck in my head that he said uh, there's, a, uh, there's a problem or, or the title is called When Chief of Sinners Become the Moral Guardians of the Universe when 
and chief of sinners become the moral guardians of the universe. It becomes a real problem and a hypocrisy in a lot of our judgment when we start thinking we leave this place and to think it's my job to save everybody and to tell them all the things that they're doing wrong. And then we put these sets of lenses on for what we receive because it's a message of God's grace, but it sometimes depends on the church that we grow up in. Yeah, it's about God's grace and he loves you and he saved you, but you also have to do A, B, and C. And, and if you aren't doing this and you aren't doing that, and what happens is exactly what we see these phrases in Acts 15, verse 1. So men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So Paul's preaching a message of grace and that you're saved by grace. And these guys are coming and saying, no, 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 no. Unless you're circumcised according to the custom and the laws of Moses, you're not saved. What happens then, then in verse 5? Notice the little different phrasing, but saying the same thing. Some believers in verse 5 came, who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. You're not really saved unless you're doing this, unless you're circumcised under the laws of Moses, unless you're following the laws of Moses. So, yeah, it's okay, it's about Jesus, but it is necessary to also do this, this, and this. Many years ago, there was a guy that I thought we were developing a friendship and, and in a Bible study kind of way and wanted to have a one-on-one -on -one kind of just Bible study and study. But I found out later he was really just trying to convert me to his church's understanding of some things. And we were reading John 3.16. Again, he knew I was a pastor, knew I was studying to be a pastor, knew I was reading the Word and doing these different things. So there was not a confusion on his part, knew I was part of a church. But we're reading John 3.16, and this is where it happened and came, came to light. You know John 3.16? You ever heard of it? Yeah. Anybody? John 3.16 says what? <clears throat> He's having me read it just like this. He wanted me to read it out loud, so I'm reading it. Keep going. For, for God so loved the world that, that whoever believes, he goes, stop, stop, hold on, stop right there. He said, that word doesn't mean just believe. I said, I'm, I'm sorry, what does, it, what does it mean? So we'll keep reading, we'll keep going on. I knew then I'm no longer in a, in, a, in a conversation, I'm in a lecture from my friend who's now telling me what I'm doing wrong. And so it wasn't just for him believe, it was you have to believe but also be baptized in the exact manner and way in which his church told them that you have to do and otherwise you're not saved. And there's all these sorts of things that we will start to put on and add to whether here in, in Acts 15, unless you do it this way, unless you're circumcised according to the customs and the laws of Moses, unless you're involved in the laws of Moses, unless you it's believe, but it believe and baptize this way, if you're not singing these songs, if you're not a part of order of worship like this, if you're not doing it this way, if you're not doing whatever the list and rules, and you all grow up in different churches, have been a part of different things, and different churches add different things of what we need to do and what we must do, right? Have you been a part of that? And so it's, I call them grace blockers. Grace blockers. Nope. Nope, nope. And sometimes some of us get it so in our head and heart that we think, oh, I'm a grace blocker. And when somebody comes along and we hear a message about the good news and the grace of Jesus Christ, we're the one to say, nope, nope, you also have to do this. Nope, if you don't do this, you're wrong. Nope, 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 you're sinning. But the Apostle Paul was preaching and teaching a message of God's grace, one that he didn't just read about in a book. I believe one that was so impressed upon his heart because of his life and his experiences with his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You've been reading in Acts, Acts chapter 9, would have hit this last week, Acts chapter 9. Apostle Paul, who is on the road in the way to go and to kill and to murder Christians, is confronted with the grace of God. And it changed his life, radically changing the course of his life. It's a grace and a, and a message that he experienced. And so when he says in Acts 15, 11, we believe that we are saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus. That's a message that he lived, that he believed, and that he experienced. This was his experience. It was in his conversion. It shaped his message, and it shaped his ministry. Remember when we looked at Acts chapter 20 with his goodbye words to the elders in Ephesus? 
Acts chapter 20, verse 24, he says, I do not account my life of any value, nor is precious to myself. If only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Nothing else matters other than me living for Jesus Christ and testifying and witnessing to and declaring and proclaiming the grace of our Lord Jesus. That's it. That's the only thing that matters. That my whole life is dependent upon that. That was his message. It was his ministry. It shaped his life. It shaped his teaching. Second uh, Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. A powerful section of scripture again. There's so many scriptures that just fit so well with our, that I think we should have, have knowledge of, have, have even memorized in terms of, of understanding who and whose we are in the message of, of the grace of Jesus Christ. Again, reading this now in light of the understanding that I don't believe this was Paul just writing these verses thinking, boy, this is going to sound really good a couple thousand years from now to put on like refrigerators in people's kitchens. I don't even think his, his first interaction with this, that this word of God that was wrestling in his own heart and life was for the church in Corinth. I, I'm coming to believe that he's writing out of the well of his own experiences with the grace of God that also just fits in the context of what's happening in Corinth. So when he writes, the love of Christ controls me, it, it, it compels me, it moves me. I think he's writing from his own experience. I, w- I want to tell you something to the church in Corinth, but it comes out of my own experience and understanding that I am being absolutely controlled and compelled by the love of Jesus Christ because I know it firsthand. I was lost. I was blind. I was dead. And I've been made alive. I see again. My paths have been made straight. Because of his grace and his love. For the love of Christ controls us, 2 Corinthians 5, 14. Because we've concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. So now I live for him, the one who died for me. Verse 16, so from now on, therefore, we regard nobody according to the flesh. We look for the spirit in a person. We're so bad at judging according to the flesh. See somebody walk in, oh, they're nothing. Oh, I've judged them immediately. I don't don't regard anybody according to the flesh. I think, again, that's coming out of the well of Paul's own own experiences. How many places would he have gone after that conversion experience where people said, oh, this is Paul? Oh, you're a Christian now. Right. Right. No, I know who you are. I know who you were, and I know who you still are. How often did he have to hear that? How often? He goes, you know, we once even regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. Again, the next verse is probably one that many of us even have on our refrigerator right now. Or or put somewhere in our lives. We have it written somewhere. I don't think Paul wrote it for that purpose. I think this was something that Paul had been living. I think this was something that God was first speaking into the heart of the Apostle Paul that later found its way into this letter to the church in Corinth. I think there would have been many times when he, he was hearing, oh, I know who Paul is. I'll just waiting for him to trick us. Oh, right, he's really converted now. Oh, right, he's really for us. Oh, right, he's really a Christian. And I believe through the Holy Spirit speaking to Paul, he would have been hearing things like, Paul, you're a new creation. You're a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come. Paul, you're a new creation. And did Paul have to leave a lot of those meetings? I'm trying, to, I'm trying to talk about this newfound faith that I have, and I got all these people telling me all these things in my past. And did he have to leave that meeting at times and say, I remind myself, I am a new creation. I'm a new creation in Christ. The old has gone, and the new has come. So 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anybody is in Christ, he is a new creation. I believe that was coming out of the well of his own experiences with God's grace. Ephesians chapter 2, 8 to 10. Good chance that we've got this one written somewhere, and for good reasons. But again, I think Paul's writing out of the well of his own experiences that then somehow, fortunately and wonderfully for us, by the, by the power and amazing grace of God, has been preserved over the years that we get to have these words still to this day. And Paul's writing in Ephesians 2, 8 to, 8 to 10, For by grace you've been saved. I know this grace because it saved me. And it's through faith. It's not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. It's not a result of works that nobody could boast. For we are his workmanship. 
We are his workmanship. We are his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him that we should walk in them. I think Paul was writing all of this out of, out of the well of his own experiences with God's grace. He lived it. This was grace believed. This was grace experienced. This was grace, this was grace that was shaping everything in his life. I think, and, and, and just the way I'm wrestling it out in my own mind, again, I, I think it was something that God was wrestling in his heart well before he would even pen it on these, on these pages. When he's going into those meetings and he's hearing those voices, you're nothing but, you're, you're, you're not this new person. This is not who you are. It's not by God's grace. You, you, you are here to trick us. You're just here to get in and secretly get in. You're going to still kill us the way that you've always done. You haven't changed. And Paul, through God speaking to him and listening to, to Jesus Christ and the grace of God in his life, would have had these moments, I think, where he's, he's wrestling and saying, no, I'm, 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 I'm in Christ. I'm, I'm in relationship with you. And I'm a new creation. The old has gone. I'm believing that. You have changed me. I've been redeemed. I've been signed, sealed, delivered. I'm yours. I'm with you. I'm, I'm your workmanship. You, you have created me in you. I'm so sorry for all the ways in which I used my time and my talent and my treasures to go against you, to literally kill people in your name. And I'm so sorry for that. But I now know that I'm saved by your grace and you've redeemed me and you've changed me. And, and, and I want to walk in you. I'm your workmanship. I, I've been created to live for you. You've created good works ahead of time for me to do. But I spit in your face because he used all my time and my talent and my treasure for me and about building my empire. And yet in the midst of that mess that I was creating in my life, you reached down and you grabbed me and you drew me home. That's grace believed. I mean, maybe not that dramatically, but is that anybody's story in the room? And I still, to this day, for me, I wrestle with these same exact scriptures. And when voices haunt me, I remind myself of these passages. And I go back to these verses, and I'm saved by his amazing grace. And grace has got to, it's got to live. It's got to become action. Second Corinthians five, he goes on. I won't, I won't go back to read it, but he goes on and he says, Hey, you and I have a ministry and we have a message and it's all about God's grace. It's about reconciliation. It's about bringing people back to God. You and I have the ministry and the message of reconciliation that God in Christ was reconciling the world to himself. And you and I are ambassadors, representatives of Jesus Christ, representatives of his goodness and his grace. You and I, I honestly, I think someday I'll get to heaven and be like, man, God, that, I just got to be honest, that seems, that seems silly. Like, you wanted to use us. But that's what we've seen throughout Acts, right? Here's Jesus in Acts 1, who tells the disciples, hey, uh, you know, I'm alive, and I died for you, just as I said, I resurrected, and they're like, okay, now's the kingdom, you can come up and like, kick all the bad guys out, and he goes, uh, I'm leaving. On a jet plane, I don't know when I'll be back again. But the Father knows the plans, and, and I don't even know. Angels long to look into those things, but you guys are gonna, you guys are gonna run things for a while. I'm gonna give you a gift. This indwelling power, the Holy Spirit, is gonna live inside of you. Like, well, 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 you're gonna leave us to run shop? What? What if the machine breaks? I won't, I won't know how to fix it. I'm giving you my word. Read it, study it, know it, talk about it, pray. The Holy Spirit's going to remind you, he's going to convict, he's going to lead, he's going to equip, he's going to guide you. It's grace in action. We're ambassadors with a ministry and with a message. But again, how quickly we forget. And the culture of grace can just be silenced out or we become grace blockers. Uh, 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 Vicki Smith had given me a, an article, I don't know, a few weeks ago, uh, that said you're reminded of this Acts series, and the title of the article was, The Top Ten Things That We Forget When We Leave Church on Sunday. Top ten things that we forget, and they're all one-word things. So, so every, everything listed is one word. Here's, here's four of the words of the top ten things. See if, you, see if these sound familiar to you at all. Four of the top ten things that we forget when we leave church. I'm, I'm trying to get them in the right order. Joy, generosity, prayer, and grace. Does that sound familiar? 
that's the four things that we just looked at in the church culture series that this article says these are four of the top ten things that Christians forget every time they leave church. We forget, we come in and we talk about joy, and then I leave and I forget about joy. We come in and we talk about being generous, and then I leave and I forget about being generous. We come in and we talk about prayer, and then I leave and I forget to pray. And then we come in and we talk about grace, and we leave and I forget to be graceful. Make no mistake about it, God is bringing all sorts of opportunities this week for us to be tested and tried and to put into action our faith of joy and generosity and prayer and grace. Will we remember or will we forget? Will we remember and live these things or will we forget? I don't know why it didn't hit me in leading up, but it hit me in first service. I want to share this with you as well. When I think about grace blockers, sometimes it's the, it's the antagonist in the room that just thinks they know everything. There's always going to be Christians that grow up in some church, get a set of lenses, told a certain way to do it, and they're going to think they got to tell us all that we're doing it wrong. It's just always going to happen. It's irritating. It's one of the most irritating things in the world to me, to be perfectly honest, but it's always going to happen. We can't get rid of it. It happened to Jesus. It happened to Paul. It'll happen continually. But do you know how many of us are grace blockers and we don't even realize it? When you hear a message like this, or you hear about God's love for you, or you hear about God creating a, doing a good work in your life, and you walk out of here, and you will leave, and you will say things like, I don't have any talent. I don't have any th good things. I'm not good. It's like you sit looking at your own dad and saying, I'm ugly. I'm stupid. Nobody likes me. I'm not good at nothing. I don't like this as a parent. Have you ever had a child say something like that to you? I'm not going to wait for the answer because we're running out of time, but I've had that happen. It breaks your heart. Don't you pour over love and blessings over that child to say, none of this is true. You believe in a lie right now. It is not true. I mean, you look at your kids and be like, you know what? I, I've been meaning to have this conversation with you. Yeah, you are those things. You don't do that. But yet so many things in our world are constantly reminding us of how just worthless we are. And you know, some of the, maybe the most difficult grace blockers for us in the room is when we hear such a message of God's love for our lives, we're like, nope, nope, not me, not me. I'm not worthy of that. I'm not that. God don't love me like that. And maybe we need to open up and allow Jesus's message of grace to just penetrate into our lives and our hearts. Stop blocking his grace. But you don't know what I've done. I probably don't want to know what you've done. But he does. And he loves you anyways. And he sent his son for you. Not to wallow in it, but to take him by the hand and allow him to lead us home. That's grace. He loves you. He absolutely loves you. And for some reason, we want to tell everybody how much he hates us more than we want to say how much he loves us. Even today, I know there'll probably be somebody, there's probably one of you in the room at least that's sitting here like, no, oh, here he goes, his watered down message. He needs to tell us all we're going to hell. Well, listen, I know the way out. I don't need to focus on hell. I don't need to look at it. Because by his amazing grace, he has set us free. So I guess that's always going to be my focus. I'd rather look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. What happens to cause us to block his grace? So our man, come on, man, come on up. What happens to, that we block this? What happens in this, that, that it happens so often in every culture of church that creates this dynamic in us of people that we hear such a wonderful message and we have to look around and start judging everybody in the room and telling them, nope, you're wrong, you messed up, nope, you haven't done this right, nope, you haven't read that right, nope, you haven't done that. And there's just such a, a negative culture that gets created. What happens? Unless you do it this way, it is necessary that you do this. To allow a culture of grace to transform our lives in this church. Fix your eyes on Jesus Christ, the scripture says. So we've been talking the negative unless, and it is necessary. There is a positive unless, and it comes from my good friend, the Lorax. The Lorax. Do you know the unless? Unless somebody cares a whole awful lot, nothing's going to change. It's not. As Christians, let's live in that. Let's live in that. I want to live the unless, but I want to live the unless of the Lorax.
that if you and I leave this place today and we start doing this to everybody, unless you do it my way, unless you do it this way, unless you do it the way that I was told, every one of us have grown up in some kind of church or some kind of background that taught us something in some way and you're not doing it the right way and you don't do this right and you don't do this. I went to this church, CBC, for years and now I left and I, I got a whole new wardrobe of all long sleeve shirts because that's what we have to do. That's what church is and if you don't do it right, you're not doing it right. Let's not become that. But let's be, unless somebody cares a whole awful lot, nothing's going to change. It's not transformed by his grace. I think what Paul was doing and saying was he was living in and living out the goodness of God. He was living in and living out the goodness of God. This last song we sing as we close is a prayer. I feel like it's just a personal testimony of Paul even saying, all my life he has been so good to me. All my life he has been so faithful. All my life he has been so, so good. And I love him. And he loves me. And he's changing and transforming my life. He saved me. He set me free. I'm going to walk in that path. A culture of grace. Grounded in his word. Of joy. Of generosity. Of prayer. And grace. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your many gifts to us. Your many blessings. For your grace for your love, your mercy over our lives. Thank you, Father, for for this church community and fellowship. That we can gather like this every week to be reminded of these things, to hear these things, to pray, to sing, to hear your word. But I pray, Father, that we would not forget that the culture of this church would be changed and renewed and growing each and every day and each and every week. But as we leave this church empowered by your spirit, being guided by your word, guided by your son, changed, transformed, renewed, blessed by your grace, may that culture that happens here transform the world around us. Father, may we not forget, but live every moment, every day in your presence, in your grace consumed by your generosity in prayer with you and having the joy of the Lord that is our strength. Thank you, Father, for all the ways in which you continue to bless and guide us. If there's anyone here today, Father, that does not know you as personal Savior, I pray, Father, today for them that you would you would tug on their heart, speak into their lives, draw them into relationship with you. They would reach out in faith. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen.